back to the Richy Rich Chemist. Today's episode is the spectroscopist. What does that mean? Let's find out from Dr. Viola Caroline DeMello, postdoctoral scholar at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Before we proceed, pause, press that subscribe button and the bell notification. The biggest question on everyone's mind now, is a spectroscopist like a Jedi from Star Wars? What is your regular day like? I do work with lasers a lot. <laughs> yes. Um, I am a laser spectroscopist as in I work with gas phase samples. So the samples are really rare as in there are very few molecules in the samples that you can detect. So in this case, we need a very strong light source which is provided by lasers. So yeah, on uh, before the experiment, there is a lot of playing around with optics mirrors, lenses, etc. to get your lasers uh, focused at your sample. Uh, and uh, on the day of the experiment, actually, it's a lot of waiting for data to get acquired. And after, it's a lot of staring at computer screens and analyzing your data, reading a lot of literature, and then finally writing down your results into a paper. But I believe most of this is also true of any other scientist who's doing research. I know that you did your BSc from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. After that, yeah. you came to St. Aloysius College, Mangalore and did your master's where I had the privilege of being uh, your lecturer. And yeah. uh, how was your journey after that? Yes. Uh, so till I was in my master's program, I did not think that I'd be doing a PhD or pursuing research. It's an inception thing, right? <laughs> so my inspiration comes from St. Aloysius College, from Richard, uh, who encouraged and helped me see that I can do this. And uh, during the summer between the first and the second year of master's, I applied to the Summer Research Fellowship, uh, which is organized by the IASC or the Indian Academy of Sciences in Bangalore and that was the beginning of my research career. How did you get into your uh, PhD? I gave the GATE exam which is primarily for the IITs but the core is uh, is something that many research organizations look at in India. If you have a good GATE score uh, they will consider you to be a student. And also I gave the NET exam. Third exam that I gave was for Data Institute of Fundamental Research, which organizes the graduate school exams every year. I qualified the exam that I joined TIFR in Mumbai. You first have a coursework for a year or so, during which you also uh, have an exposure to all the research that is happening in your department and then you can decide what you want to do. My research project was in gas phase spectroscopy called supersonic jet spectroscopy. Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> first time even I was taken uh, aback by the name. Like, After your PhD, uh, how did you get into uh, the postdoc? There are vacancies that are put out on various websites. You can actually look at the universities that you're interested in and at the labs that you're interested in. And you can always email them with your ideas, with your CV. There are other grants that you can apply. To. I know about the Mercury Fellowship, the Humboldt Fellowship, Fulbright yeah. Fellowship. These are only a few there are many more you did a master's degree then a phd then one postdoc then a startup now a second postdoc among these which one is the most challenging phase uh, definitely my phd because uh, in india you're actually not exposed to the difficulties of research till you get into it because uh, bachelors and masters also i would believe there is very little uh, importance given to research as in just doing something new and you know accepting the failure of of day-to-day -day experiments is something that a student doesn't know when one gets into research. There's a lot of failure and then one day there's that little Eureka movement which is which may not be great but uh, I guess that's the difficult part and it's a lot it takes a lot of your life so you really have to like what you're doing to yeah. do your PhD. I would uh, say that. I know you were a brilliant student from the start uh, being your own teacher but how did you develop the love for studying chemistry, uh, you know, especially during your younger days? I think I always liked science because of which I got into it for my bachelor's also. But um, uh, specifically chemistry, it started during my bachelor's. 
uh, I, I had great teachers always. I always had great teachers and I had a very that good rapport true. with them. Yes, that includes you. So, so I am thankful for that. And for some reason, I just felt comfortable in chemistry more, much more than I did in math and physics. And it was something that I felt I was very comfortable in and I understood. I guess I just liked it. <laughs> I definitely worked hard. I did well in my classes, yes. Also science, I found it always, it's, it's like a puzzle, right? If you understand the little pieces that make up the whole puzzle, you can see the whole picture. So the fundamentals are right, you will definitely understand. Tell us some of your most exciting research projects. Uh, I feel like if I choose a project, I'll be doing uh, injustice to all other projects because they are all like your babies, you know, you've spent so much time on each project. But uh, if I have to mention one, it would be a project from my PhD where I studied these aromatic molecules uh, which contain nitrogen and I determined exactly how much energy is required to break one of them. That one piece of information that I have uh, given to the sea of science is, is my own. So that's precious to me. Uh, just last week, we were at the synchrotron facility studying Fullerene. So, um, you have navigated from chemistry to a role in the Department of Physics, mm -hmm. but what topics of basic chemistry do you use in your routine work? I definitely think like a chemist. Your frame of reference is your molecule, <laughs> and right. always for a chemist. At some point of time, depending on your project, you may need to know a little bit of everything. It is after all, it's all atoms and molecules. <laughs> what skills do you think one should develop to become successful in a research career? A lot of reading. You have to do extensive reading in your field because uh, you don't reinvent the wheel always, right? You have to know what has come before you in order to ask newer questions, to be patient and perseverant. Uh, so the general impression that people have about researchers is that they are sad, depressed, boring nerds. Uh, how do you manage to find fun in your life? During my master's, I had a lot of extracurricular activities going on, but I was a student back then. But even during my PhD, I think uh, I personally managed my time very badly. <laughs> I did not have a great work-life balance but that's true for me but even then uh, I found time for cultural activities I learned Bharatnatyam during that time uh, and uh, after that when I joined my postdoc you have to learn to manage your time it's like any other job there are stretches of very stressful time which was just last week for me and then there are stretches when which are not so stressful. Since you were Richard Sir's student, tell me what impressed you the most about Richard Sir? His humility. I mean, when you talk to him, he will not exude that, you know, I'm an important man. <laughs> his teaching skills, his openness to questions, always being available. He told me once that I am always here in the department. I am always here. <laughs> Thank you, Viola, for your time. It was indeed a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. We have done our bit. Now it is your turn. Like and share the video far and wide so that you can encourage many more richy rich chemists. I will see you next Saturday.